Well, it was billed as a battle of samba versus reggae, but on a windy night in Melbourne, when the music stopped, it's Brazil going home. Hello and welcome to Dub at the Cup. I'm Teo Pelizzeri. Joining us is Matilda and Melbourne City player Carly Rossbacken. Carly, great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. And we're also joined by Western United coach Mark Torcaso. Mark, thanks for jumping on. Thanks, no problems. So we've just walked out of Amy Park, and even though it was a nil-all draw, we probably should start with the game we've just watched, which is Brazil knocked out, and Marta's final World Cup appearance ends in disappointment. Carly, sum up the mood and the atmosphere in there at full time as Brazil collapsed to their knees and Jamaica was celebrating at the end of the game because Brazil are out and Jamaica are through to the round of 16. I think a lot of heartbreak for the Brazilian girls. It was Marta's last World Cup, and I know a lot of the players wanted to go out there and do it for her, just like... A lot of the Argentinian players did it for Messi, but fortunately it didn't go their way and that's how football goes. But a lot of excitement for the Jamaican girls as well. I know they were in there dancing, they had their little dance routines going and I think it's a really important move for the Jamaican community as well. So, you know, bittersweet, unfortunate for the Brazilians, but a lot of happiness for the Jamaicans. Mark, what went wrong for Brazil? They drew a blank tonight. Uh, I think I think Jamaica just defended extremely well. They did it um, the same against uh, France in the first the first game as well. So uh, you could see that they were going to um, be quite strong. Um, but yeah, I, th I think they just a bit of passion. Hopefully that's not their grand final. Uh, hopefully they come out in the, in the next round and, and perform as well. Just a word on Marta. Obviously <coughs> one of the attacking players that got the start tonight, but not able to find the back of the net. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, last if, if it's her last game, uh, we think it is. But um, yeah, she's been a tremendous. Uh, advocate for the game and um, unfortunate scene but I guess like Carly said there's going to be a loser. What do you think went wrong with Brazil in attack tonight because it actually felt as the second half went, went on they got further away from scoring than closer they probably had their best chances in the first half. Yeah I'm not really sure to be honest like they started the game really strong and they had a lot of numbers going forward and they were playing the little small passes that they normally do. They were crossing the ball in from wide areas a lot tonight, which I thought was a little bit strange because I feel like the way that they play is a bit more direct and they like to move the ball like one metre passes and that's how they find their goals a lot of the time. So I thought it was a little bit like strange them reverting to crossing the ball in so much because they also, the Jamaicans, the two Swaby sisters, they have a lot of height um, in the box and they're really dominant in the air and Marta and Dabina not being so all it kind of didn't work in their favor mark uh, off the back of carly's points what do you think went wrong for brazil but also what were the strengths because you were also at jamaica's nil all draw with france where i think uh, again they showed great defensive composure yeah and, and the goalkeeper was was definitely composed but um as to what carly was saying the goalkeeper didn't have to make a lot of saves like big saves um it was a lot of you know simple catches or or something just pretty easy falling down to the side but um you know i think that's that's a credit to Jamaica's defence and, and the way they sort of maintained, I guess, composure at the right times of the game. Um, you know, I, I expected a lot more from Brazil, to be quite honest. I thought they would give us a little bit more entertainment. Uh, I don't want to be disrespectful to the Brazilian team, but I thought a little bit more entertainment. But I just think Jamaica held themselves quite well. Carly, they were so brilliant in the win against Panama. And yes, it's a different standard of opposition, but were they so good that maybe mentally something changed for this Brazilian team? They thought it was just going to happen naturally for them because some of the goals they scored against Panama were Harlem Globetrotters sort of stuff and tonight they couldn't get anything going and there was one point where I think there was a back heel that was just totally uncalled for and it gave away possession and you heard the groans and they just couldn't click the way they had in that first game of the World Cup. I think you have to give credit to Jamaica as well. Like They've obviously come out with a game plan and you saw it against France and they haven't conceded a goal yet so they've really built on from the last world cup and i think that you have to give credit to jamaica as well like they've like i said they had a game plan they went out there they stuck to it you could tell like even from their goal kicks they weren't taking any risks they went long every single time every free kick was just no risk get it out of there so they were really strong defensively and it was really frustrating brazil that you could see like you said with the back heel everything wasn't clicking you could see the brazilians arms going up like marta was frustrated to a T and that's exactly what they wanted to do though Jamaica. From a coaching point of view Mark, triple sub by Pia Sundhag at the 80, 80 minute mark, was that too late? I mean we've seen Tony Gustafsson criticised, Vlatko Andonovsky, the USA coach criticised for not making enough subs or not making aggressive enough subs. What was your read on the things that Brazil tried to change this game? I think momentum and the coaches probably acknowledged that at that time was probably their right time to do it. Um, 
I think you read a lot more into the game as the moment's happening on the touchline and, and maybe the coach felt at that time that was the best time to do it. Um, personally, you know, I probably would have done something a little bit earlier. Um, but again, that's just purely my opinion. In the end, you know, they still didn't create enough with those three changes with 10 minutes to go with the four extra time. Um, but again, it's football. That's what it is. The Brazil fans in Brisbane were awesome, but there was also a lot, lot more of them. They bought plenty tonight. There was a good atmosphere around the ground. But how sad is it that we lose their spectators and, and their sort of collective for the knockout rounds and we have to wave them goodbye at this point of the tournament? Yeah, they bring so much excitement. You can hear everyone chanting in there. Like, I'm pretty sure 90% of them are there for Marta as well. They are there for the whole team, but I think a lot of them were there to see Marta in her last World Cup. And it is sad because they bring so much. You hear the drums going, you hear everything going. So it will be sad to see them go. You were there in 2019. You were part of the miracle in, in Montpellier. <laughs> how much time went into preparing for Marta and how much time went into preparing for Brazil going into that game? Well, I came in late to the tournament, so I know that they would have worked on it a lot, probably a lot more than before I came in. But a lot went into it. We well, we back ourselves anyways. We know that they're a powerhouse. We played against them a few times before. So we kind of knew what we would expect. But yes, a lot went in and we knew the kind of players that they had. Because um, like I said, they are a powerhouse nation and you've got to prepare for big teams like that. Mark, uh, Amy Park has been a, a bit of a burial ground for some of the legends of the game. Christine Sinclair, goodbye. Marta, goodbye. And the United States and Megan Rapinoe are coming here for the round of 16. I mean, what is it about Melbourne which just hasn't worked out for some of the biggest names the game has ever seen? I'm happy if US is goodbye as well, by the way. But no, it's, uh, I, I'm a Melbourne person, so I don't want to say too much wrong about Amy Park or Melbourne. But um... Oh, it's a brilliant venue, but they just haven't. It's, it, maybe it's a coincidence, but it seems as though it's been a, a bit of the boneyard for, for these legends. If it knocks the big teams out, that's fine. And if it gives Australia a chance to, to win the World Cup, then we'll take it 100%. All right, the other game in the group was France 6, Panama 3. And there was a Marta who scored tonight, Marta Cox. An unbelievable free kick to open the scoring for Panama. And they led for quite a while in this game. I know that you were busy on air for this one, Carly, but as the goal up updates kept rolling through. Um, what were your thoughts on how France had this amazing roller coaster where even at 5-3 and they lifted the board to show 13 minutes of stoppage time, Panama weren't necessarily out of the game? <laughs> I think it's crazy. I think it just shows like what this World Cup's about. Like We've seen powerhouse nations be knocked out, but I guess it was a little bit surprising seeing that I thought it would have ended 5-3 and then all of a sudden it ended 6-3. So... I mean, it was just crazy, and I think it was awesome that Panama were able to score three goals, actually. Mark, the, the celebrations from Panama didn't matter that I think the, the second goal was when they were well down in the game, and then the third goal did get it back to 5-3, but just what they brought to this tournament, whether they were you know on the losing end of some one-sided score lines, they were the entertainers. I mean, they might be going home, but gee, they, they helped this tournament get some of its best highlights. Yeah, I mean, like, like Panama, there's a few other sides that have done that as well, that have, I guess, bridged the gap between the big sides, the big countries, and, and, the, and the smaller countries. So I think that's a credit to the game, is just getting bigger and bigger in the world uh, as a whole, and I think that's going to be great for us and our nation. Um, so to see some of these, I guess, smaller nations in, on, you know, on the football circuit be better, that's, that's great for our game. Just to check, I was watching on my laptop uh, the other game as the one behind us was going on. Have either of you actually seen the free kick goal from Marta Cox? Mark, talk us through it. Uh, it, was, it was phenomenal. I was actually sitting next to a couple of friends and when they showed me it, I, I took my eyes off and I had to watch it three times because it's absolutely unbelievable. It's a, it's a it. cracking goal. I reckon what we'll do, Carly, is it. we might get your reaction in, in real time. Um, I'll pull it up in a moment. But first thing I wanted to, uh, to ask you about is the additional role that you have taken on at this tournament. Obviously, it's sad and a bit frustrating that you're not playing given that you went to the last World Cup. But tell us about the broadcast role that you're currently doing and the perspective it's giving you on how you see the game. I'm really enjoying it. I think it's given me another... You can plug it. It's the ABC. You can plug <laughs> the ABC. <laughs> yes, the ABC. So I'm doing radio work with them. And I actually really enjoy it. It's given me a different role to be a part of the World Cup. Um, so I'm really enjoying it. And it's allowing me to see the game in a different light as well and really expand my game through watching it. You're not going to be retired for at least another 12 to 15 <laughs> years, though. So is it nice to know that you can come back to this a long way into the future? Yeah. I have to remind myself that... I am only 22 years old because I, I do get a bit frustrated. So, yes, I do have a long way to go, but I think that this is actually going to help my game as well. So, 
All right, uh, this is Dub at the Cup. We will get on to talking about Italy in a moment, but, uh, Carly, I'm going to get your reaction in real time. Just so we don't get a copyright violation, I'm going to mute <laughs> this free kick. But here, talk me through what you, you're witnessing here from Marta Cox. Oh, my God. I have to watch that again. Wait, <laughs> let me take that back. So this was a free kick. Oh, yeah. Oh third, my third, god! Third minute of the game. Third, third minutes. Yeah. Did they score first? Yeah, they scored first. Jesus, that's that's insane. You, that's wanted, you wanted to swear then, didn't you? Yeah, <laughs> I actually did. I almost did, but have you, have you seen yeah. a better goal this tournament? Because I mean, Brazil scored a pretty special one, and we've seen some some hot stuff. But have you seen a better goal than that in this World Cup? No, I think that actually might be goal of the tournament. To be fair, We're pushing for Can it. Can I jump in there? I think the Italian own goal. <laughs> Second goal conceded today was as good. All right, well. <laughs> I have some games to watch. Carly, you're on with uh, two Italians here. Mark, we, let, let's, get, let's get to the post-mortem. Italy are out of the World Cup. Now, on Dub at the Cup last night, I did predict that South Africa would win. And when they took a 2-1 lead and Italy pulled it back to 2-2, I thought, here we go. South Africa have led in all three games and they might go home empty-handed. But they scored one more time. It was a fantastic win for South Africa. But what does it say about where Italy are at in international football? Well, someone, as I was walking in, said, um, are you proud that you finally got a team in the World Cup for many years? So um, it was good to obviously see them in the World Cup, but now they're, they're out. So um, oh, they're going to be shattered. They're going to be absolutely shattered because they probably should get out of their, that group. Um, and the way they went down, uh, you know, the goal was pretty controversial in the end, but um, they're out now as well, and that's another good nation that's out of the tournament, and, and that gives a, a team like South Africa an opportunity to do something special. An own, an own goal like that can happen to anyone in, in football. We, we've all seen it, but on the biggest stage of all, international football, you would expect your team to have better cohesion than to hit a back pass that firmly and for your goalkeeper to get caught out in that manner. Yeah, I couldn't believe, like, I actually watched it three times after she did not even look where her goalkeeper was standing. She just turned and hit the ball straight back with so much power. And listen, I think the goalkeeper could have probably done a lot better to try and stop it. But, um, yeah, it was it was pretty heartbreaking for, for, the, for the young little girl. But it is. It's football, isn't it? Carly, you're looking at me like you're wondering if I'm going to bring up that own goal you scored for Canberra <laughs> when I was commentating. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, but no, no, no. Right no, no to do we're not going to talk about it. Don't worry. I want to, I want to ask you about uh, the group broadly, Mark. Um, Sweden, they took care of business against Argentina. They rotated their entire team, but they still got a lot of good players. And it means they're coming here to Amy Park to take on the United States of America. Um, Mark and Carly, I'll get both your thoughts, but what does this mean for the tournament to have two potential winners meeting so early in the knockout rounds? Yeah, I, I'm going to just give a tip straight away. I, I think that Sweden's probably going to beat them uh, in extra time. Um, they're, I think they're well-rounded. I think they're a pr pretty good side, and if we look in the way the US sort of came off their last game, I'm not 100% sure that they were convincing. Um, Jess McDonald will probably get upset about that, but I said that. But in the end, I think Sweden's probably going to be going to be doing the job on them. Carly, your thoughts on that match in prospect now? I have to agree, actually. I think Sweden have been doing really well this tournament and even pre-tournament. They've, they've been doing exceptionally well. I was just talking to my dad about it, and my dad is Norwegian, and he does not like Sweden. And he was even saying that, nah, they've been phenomenal. And we saw, like... US were luckily lucky to get through actually past the group stage. So I think it's gonna be a really a really good match, but I'm gonna to have to probably tip Sweden. Heartwarming to hear some Scandinavian solidarity <laughs> here on top of the cup. Um, so I guess the big issue that the United States face is that because they are such a popular team, they have everyone coming for them, including Carly Lloyd, who has been so strong in her criticism. And you yourself, you know, you are only early in your career. You're juggling a media role as you, you look to get back and, you know, get back to this international level. How difficult are you finding it to make sure you choose the right words? Because you've commentated the Matildas in this tournament. But also, how do you think the United States players are feeling about Carly Lloyd, one of their legends, just throwing grenades from the outside? I think it's a little bit of a different level. Like she's obviously a legend, and like she's retired and everything, so she probably has a bigger voice. Um, but I would say they probably are a little bit frustrated. But maybe it's something that they need to hear to get a kick up their butt. So, but they probably are a little bit disheartened, a little bit okay, a bit frustrated what she's saying. But at the end of the day, if that's her opinion, that's her opinion. And if she's gonna go and voice it, and she feels comfortable doing that, then like credit to her. Mark, how important is a coach in this situation to shield the players from the outside world and, and to sort of keep them on track and in their bubble? Because 
I think if there's one team that's going to read all the social media comments and listen to all the punditry, it's the Americans. So mm. what can the US do internally to manage the criticism from the outside and make sure the players don't internalise it the wrong way? I think it's going to be really hard. Obviously, it being a World Cup and there's so much media around it and, um, and conversation about it, it's going to be extremely hard. Like, I'll, Honestly, I wouldn't even know the answer to that because it would be a very tough situation to shelter that, especially when you've got a legend potentially you know, making some comments about it. So I think in the end, um, who knows, US might come out and be an absolute powerhouse the next game. You, like, they might just come out and destroy everyone and our, our predictions might be irrelevant. But um, I guess that's the, the quality of the US. But you know, I think that there's a lot of professionals in that side that will probably be able to deal with the, those types of things pretty well. Now, uh, as far as uh, the Matildas in Australia is concerned, Carly, um, have you heard much from inside the bubble? Are you, do you feel as though you're outside the team at the moment? They've done so well, the Matildas, to top their group. They've obviously got Denmark next. Um, what are you hearing? What are you feeling about this Matildas team? And give us your impressions on how the tournament is going for them so far. <laughs> you're getting some inside goss, are you? <laughs> um, no, so obviously, like, some of my best mates are in that team. So I speak to Charlie quite often. I caught up with her and Kyra the other day. And, yeah, they fill me in on everything. But I think... They're just buzzing. I mean, after the last win, I'm, they were shattered from the Nigeria game. They were also very frustrated because they know that they should have done better. So that's why they came out and they absolutely came firing against Canada. And those girls are the best bunch of girls and they can handle pressure pretty well. And I know that going into this game, they're going to be fired up and they're all just really positive and happy at the moment. How does your dad feel about the Danish? <laughs> He's fine with them, actually. <laughs> All right, so it was it was Norway, it was uh, Sweden that he had a problem with. Yeah. All right. Okay. Mark, uh, just quickly, your thoughts on on where the Matildas are at? I mean, we're five days away from this game, so we still got all the way through until Monday. It does seem as though the pressure valve has been released. There's a lot less talk about Sam Kerr's calf because the Matildas bought themselves an extra week. So where do you see their progression through this tournament at the moment? Yeah, I think similar to what I was saying about the US team, like they came out of nowhere after that that four game that they had against Nigeria. So for them to have come out and, and played the way they played and got a result. Um, I, I think they can do anything right now, like the way they, they played in that game. So, um, you know, like Carly said, I think the group's obviously quite tight. Um, they're, they're pretty, I think mean, they're pretty gathered together. They're, they're pretty much an organised group. And I think uh, as a whole, I think that will probably carry them as, as deep as they can possibly go. And I'm, like, I'm, I'm thinking they're going to be able to get to a semi-final at least and even to a final with the way wow. they say, carried on from that last game. So, And with the big scalps out, you just never know. Well, out or out of form, which is important. Now, I just want to loop back to something you did mention. And don't worry, you don't have to give us any insider goss. But <laughs> how happy are you for Charlotte Grant? Because first two games, I was thinking, gee, she spent this year deputising for Ellie Carpenter. Now is she even going to get onto the pitch? And some of the Carly and Charlie stuff that you two have done uh, in the media over the years has just been a delight. So I know what a great combo you two are. But how happy were you for her to get on the pitch, get those minutes, and just know that she's there and she's ready if the Matildas need to call on her for more? Well, I was sitting in the stands and I actually got tears in my eyes. That's how happy and proud I am of her. She deserves it 100%. Like, seeing her go out there, and she's done so well when Ellie and Steph was injured briefly as well. Like, she stepped in and she stepped up to the plate. So she deserves to have minutes in this tournament. And to see her run out there and get her World Cup debut, I actually... It brought tears to my eyes, and I just couldn't be prouder of her. You you know her so well. The work she's put in, going overseas at a young age to Sweden, and you know Rosengarten now a current club as well. The travel, the effort, it happened during COVID, and you were living a similar journey with your time in Norway. I mean, tell us just how hard it has been this journey. We see the smile, we see the happiness, we see the moment of, of victory at the end of that game. But what about the struggle? How hard has she had to work? She's had to work very hard and she's one of the most hardworking people I've known. And to move across to the other side of the world and her time at Rosengard was challenging for her. I spoke to her a lot, like almost every day, and it was challenging. She was struggling to get playtime, but she pushed through. Like, that's just who she is and she will always have a smile on her face and she won't let anyone show if she's down. But she's also away from family and at a young age, it is very hard and you have to do long distance with everyone in your life. And... When you're not playing as well, it can really take a toll on your confidence. But she's just come out of the other end of it. like, And like I said, like, I couldn't be proud of her. And she's just worked so hard. And she went to a club in Sweden with Minnie and Polks, which has really helped her as well. And 
yeah, she's just she's just striving, Charlie. I think, and I just it honestly brings the biggest smile on my face. It clearly is. Now, now, Mark. <laughs> Um, Tony Gustafsson was certainly getting criticised after the first two games because he's only used 14 players. A few more got off the bench in the most uh, recent game and there was a safety net to do that. Do you think the Matildas, with this seven-day break, will be in a position that their starting 11, that they're, what they believe is their strongest 11, can continue to carry them through? Or do you suspect that Tony Gustafsson will need to turn to the bench more and earlier to get his team through potentially six or seven games in this tournament. Yeah, I think the seven days is no doubt going to help them in regards to having players more uh, available and ready. Um, but I think as we get deeper into the tournament, he's going to need you know that 16th, 17th player. So um, there's no doubt that at some point that's going to happen. Um, we just got to make sure that you know this next seven days they get the right recovery and the right preparation for the next one. Uh, and then hope that you know the, the, the depth is going to kick in at some point. And, and I think it will. I think we'll need to use that at some point. Now, just quickly, a couple of uh, questions on, on what you're taking out of the tournament. As a coach, what's the biggest thing you've learnt other than corners, uh, headers, P&P? Gee, I don't know. Western United were kind of ahead of the curve on that in an A-League since last season. You must be pretty happy that you've paired Catherine Zimmerman with Hannah Keane for next season now, and you've got a few more intimidating targets, a little bit like some of the teams we've seen sc score so many headed goals in this World Cup. Oh, man, like, this is... I just love the fact that we've got a World Cup here, and, and this is the, the most important thing for us. Uh, we've got a World Cup here, and it's ho helping our game. It's going to increase it. Um, obviously, you know, young girls wanting to play the game, and, um, you know, Hannah Keane scoring some headers, Zim delivering, um, I'm OK with that. Um, but, yeah, for, from a coaching perspective, like, I've, I've been able to watch things and making sure that I get my subs at the right time now. Like, I know that's been a big <laughs> criticism for many people, so I'll make sure that I get my substitutions at the right times now. But, um, yeah, you look at the game differently, obviously, when, you, when you're watching it live to when you're watching it on TV. So, you know, watching, you know, every little bit of the game, even what how the coach moves around on the field and what they do, um, yeah, I'm, I'm taking a lot from this. And it's a great experience to be able to watch this on our home soil. You've got playing-age children and you've been involved in hands-on grassroots coaching forever and a day. What do you think this is going to do for the game in this country? Like, now that the games are happening, we can all talk about it in anticipation, but now that we're just past the halfway point of the tournament, what are you hoping to see reflected at that grassroots level? Yeah, well, I mean, I also work at a school during the day, and I've noticed a lot, like, not just uh, young girls, but boys are also now knowing who Seth Catley is. And Sam Kerr, like, is now, you know, it's a name, it's a proper name in, in, in even in our schools. So... Uh, I think the the impact has to be that everyone knows our Matildas as well as they know our Socceroos. And there's one thing that we always said at Western, you know, we always made sure that our girls are responsible for making sure that the next girl wants to play um, the game. Um, and that's what the World Cup's going to bring to us here. It's going to it's going to change the dial and it's going to make sure that so many more people want to play and young girls want to play, but more importantly, recognise and acknowledge our, our Matildas. Now, Carly, when we were speaking to Emily Gilnick in Brisbane, she had that fire to get back into the Matildas for the Olympic qualifiers at the end of October. Take us through where your journey back to playing is going. Melbourne City, I, I see you in the Melbourne City tracksuit doing your workouts and going through <laughs> your rehab, a very long pre-season, but where are you at? Uh, are we going to be seeing you in A-League Women's, but also how motivated are you now to get back to this level given you have already been to a World Cup? Oh, <laughs> it's been a long, frustrating couple of years. So, like, just to get back on the pitch and, like, playing consistently, playing consistent minutes and training every day is what, like, I'm itching to get back to. Um, so, at the moment, like, it's going pretty slowly, but I've, this is my, I've had three surgeries now, so I really just want to take the time and get it right and, like, not rush back. So, I am... The plan is to hopefully get some minutes this season like I really really want to and it's I am on track for that but at the same time I am just taking my time and I really want to get this right because I don't want to have another setback. And this is the foot we're talking about? Yes, still the foot. <laughs> Well, all we can do is wish you good luck because we know how good you are at your best. All right, let's wrap up Dub at the Cup by taking a look ahead to the final group games tomorrow. Uh, they are both 8pm, so Dub at the Cup will be coming to you a little bit later tomorrow night, around this time after those games have finished. Germany have to try and bounce back against Korea. Korea have been so poor in this tournament, but I can think of a Men's World Cup not too long ago where Korea beat Germany to knock them out. So, Mark Torcaso, will Germany bounce back from their loss to Colombia or uh, will Korea potentially knock Germany out of the World Cup? No, I think I think Germany is going to come good at the right time. It was a little hiccup, but I think that they'll, they'll be... 
I think they're the best, one of the best teams in the competition, and I think they'll definitely go all the way and get to that final. So I think they'll be sorted uh, after this game, and, and they'll be really raring to go going into the finals into that round of 16. Carly, you were there for Germany versus Colombia. What went wrong there that they need to fix for this game against Korea? Well, Colombia, they took their chances. I mean, I don't think that they Germany had that many chances in on goal. And which was a bit rare for them. And I, they got so frustrated. They're a possession based team and they got so frustrated. Colombia just worked them to the ground and they just kept forcing the play and going long. And they actually, yeah, they took out Pop as well, actually. I think the centre backs did really well on her just to let her know that, you know, that they're there. And she ended up dropping so deep in the midfield, which kind of took away their number nine. So. I think it really worked. Like they frustrated them to a T, and then they couldn't really play that they normally play Germany. So I think going to this game, they're probably going to focus more on that and just going back to how they play. And your prediction then is Germany to win, or do you think Korea can get something <laughs> off them? Oh, I think Germany is going to get this game. I think they're going to come out firing because you could see how angry they were after the last game. So I think they're going to bounce back from this. And we just heard your thoughts on Colombia. Do they take care of business against Morocco? Do they win the group? And uh, that would set up a match against Jamaica in the round of 16. Yeah, I think so. I think Colombia's got it. I am honestly loving Colombia at the minute. They've, they're doing so well and the way that they play is so exciting. So I think that they've, all got, they've got the positive vibe. They've got the energy. they also got Linda Casado who's thriving at the moment. So, I mean, I, I back them and I think that they're going to top the group. And Mark, your prediction for Colombia-Morocco? Uh, brilliant tip uh, on the first episode. Grace said that uh, Linda was going to be one of the best players in the competition. <laughs> so, so that was a big shout and she, it's coming good at the moment. She's got an absolute <laughs> crack of it. Colombia is going to be a real dangerous side, I think, going into that, that round of 16 as well. And their run looks like it could be pretty good. So, yeah, I think they're going to be dangerous. All right, Mark Torcaso, pre-season starting soon for Western United. Uh, all the best backing up from your amazing first season uh, at, with the club in the A-League Women's. And, uh, of course, you can get yourself the Liberty A-League Pass as well. Just Google it, Liberty A-League Pass. And uh, if you are a registered player, you can go to games for free if you pick up that pass, but you can also sign up for it as well. Um, so all the best to you and to Western United. Thank you. And Carly Ross back in. Your media work will continue through this tournament commentating. You have been marvellous here. I can tell you're analysing games on radio <laughs> because you've come ready with so many good points about the teams and how they're playing. So clearly it's working. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Thank you for having me. All right. Uh, this has been Dub at the Cup. Taryn Hedo, our regular host, Get Well. She will be back before the tournament's out, as will Pakua Frimpong. But on behalf of Mark Torcaso and Carly Ross back in, you can follow Keep Up's World Cup coverage, Facebook, Instagram, keepup.com.au, and wherever you get your social media, really. Plus, you can also subscribe to the podcast in iTunes and Apple Podcasts. No, I said iTunes last night and I got roasted for it. In Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Try those two. iTunes, LimeWire, Napster, maybe not. All right. My name's Teo Pelazeri. That's it for Dove at the Cup. We're calling it a wrap. Good night.